Endobogeny is a synthetic approach to medicine that is based on listening to the patient, doing a detailed physical examination, doing a specialized blood evaluation, coming to a conclusion about what is the root cause of the patient's illness, and then choosing the best treatment based on an understanding of the patient as a whole as well as the origin of their disease. So to go over these three uh, aspects of endobogeny in detail, the first is the consultation and listening to the patient. Endobogeny uh, is a form of modern medicine which is based on understanding physiology, the way that modern science has described the functioning of the hormones, of the endocrine system, of the nervous system, of the digestive tract, etc. When a patient comes to your office and they have a complaint, it's important to listen to the patient and go into detail and uh, ask them very particular questions, but also to give them time to talk and tell their story. Part of the reason that uh, patients will go years without a proper diagnosis or a proper treatment <clears throat> it's because physicians don't have the time or are not able to take the time to properly listen to the patient explain when they first got sick, what was going on in their life, what was the season, was it close to their birthday, did somebody just die, did they lose their job. These types of uh, information help us more precisely understand what other hormonal variants could have affected the presentation of the disease. So listening to the patient, asking them uh, pointed questions about uh, their conception, their birth, their childhood, adverse childhood events, traumas during their life, uh, their social situation, their work situation. Even though these are not the illness, these are all factors which can change how intensely the illness expresses itself. And it can also give us a clue, as I mentioned, to the hormonal variance based on seasonal changes that affect the presentation of a disease. Many times in our practice we hear patients say things but we don't know how to interpret what they're telling us and so we either disregard it or we put it aside for another time that never comes. From the perspective of endobiogeny everything that the patient says and every way they describe their illness and the words that they choose to describe how they feel the pain in their body or how they feel uh, when something isn't going well is all a clue that uh, we can teach you how to interpret. So even if you don't have a long time to listen to the patient, you can ask them very uh, specific questions which will allow you to quickly get to the heart of the problem for each patient. Once you've taken the time to listen to the patient, however much time you have, you start to come to some synthetic conclusions or some tentative conclusions about what might possibly be the hormonal drivers behind their illness. The second step of the endobiogenic evaluation is a detailed physical examination. It's very important to have the patient undress and be able to look at every part of their body. The length of the eyelashes, how thick the eyebrows are, the size and shape of the lips, how the tongue looks, uh, the quality of the nails, how the abdomen feels when you palpate it and you press deeply over the pancreas or the liver, if the feet hang out or hang in when the person lays down, uh, their deep tendon reflexes, their pulse, if their hands are warm or cold, all of these things are clues to how the neuroendocrine system is managing or has managed the development of the outer part of the body. And then through deep palpation, we start to evaluate some of the inner aspects of the body as well. Again, in this way, we can come to a second set of conclusions which can confirm what we heard in the consultation and listening to the patient. And it can also bring in new information that the patient was not able to tell us 
because instead of having symptoms reported by the patient, we have objective signs that are determined by the physician. The third level of evaluation is a special form of analysis of the patient's blood results called the biology of functions. As physicians, when we order blood tests, the, the typical way of analyzing the blood is what we call a binary system, meaning there's only two options that we look at. We simply want to know, are the blood results normal or are they abnormal? If all the blood tests are normal, we say that the patient is healthy, even when they come in with specific symptoms and they tell us they're not feeling healthy. And sometimes patients have normal blood work and they die six weeks later from lung cancer. So just from these simple types of observations, we come to the conclusion that looking at the blood tests with this binary uh, method of thinking of normal or not normal is not enough to understand how the uh, human body's physiology is and what the true terrain of the patient is. Through uh, over two decades of research and clinical application, the founders of endobiogeny have observed how different types of biomarkers in the blood tests, such as a complete blood count, a white blood cell, red blood cell, platelets, osteocalcin, potassium, calcium, and other types of uh, biomarkers are the reflection or the end result of how the neuroendocrine system has managed the metabolism of the body. So in other words, the way that we normally look at blood tests is a quantitative analysis. We look at the number, there's a range, and we simply want to know how much potassium is in the blood or how high the white blood cell count is or how, what percentage of neutrophils there are in the blood. But what the biology of functions offers is a qualitative analysis. So we have blood tests and through our research and the research of thousands of researchers over the last 100 years, we've been able to link the rise and fall of certain levels of biomarkers in the blood to specific hormonal activity. When you take the, the biomarkers and you understand that they reflect this type of activity from the hormones, then you can indirectly look at the way in which hormones manage every aspect of metabolism and every aspect of a disease. So the biology of functions is a qualitative way of analyzing the, the blood. And how this is done is that one blood result is divided by another or multiplied by another. So what we're looking at is, for example, the effects of testosterone relative to estrogen. For example, I was reading recently in an article a discussion about uh, the importance of testosterone as men age. And the article mentioned the uh, normal levels of testosterone in the blood. But testosterone as a hormone doesn't work by itself. The effects of testosterone need enough estrogen because estrogen initiates metabolism and testosterone ends the metabolism of proteins. So if you have normal testosterone, but you don't have enough estrogen, the testosterone is not going to function well. Testosterone needs proper thyroid function. So if you have normal testosterone, but you don't have enough thyroid activity on the cell, your testosterone still is not going to work well. So in this way, rather than measuring the blood levels of hormones, we look at their effects and we see what have they already done to metabolism. And in this way, we can create a qualitative sense of how many hormones as an ensemble have together affected the health of the human body. So we have three levels of analysis just to summarize. We have the consultation where we listen to the patient. We have the detailed physical examination where we gain objective evaluations of how the neuroendocrine system has managed the person's body and their disease. And then we have the biology of functions, which is the qualitative way of analyzing the blood results in order to gain a deeper 
level of information about how the body is functioning that we could not derive from just the history or just the examination alone. So in this way we have three different levels of information and where they overlap and confirm each other we come to the firmest and most rational conclusions about what the uh, likely origin of the patient's illness is from the perspective of the neuroendocrine system. With these tools, the endobiogenic physician can come to a rational clinical therapeutic decision on precisely which treatments to use. Endobiogeny, as a method of analyzing information, does not favor any particular treatment. The one maxim in endobiogeny is that the treatment chosen should match the severity of the disease. So the more severe the disease is, the more unlikely it is that the patient can recover on their own, the more likely you are to use a pharmaceutical drug or recommend surgery or an, an, another type of aggressive intervention. The milder the illness and the more likely the patient is to recover with support, the more likely it is that you'll be able to recommend uh, medicinal plants or uh, dietary changes or lifestyle changes or a combination of these types of products. What endobiogeny and training in endobiogenic medicine offers the physician is a way to truly understand their patient, to understand why they have the diseases that they do, to be able to anticipate the future development of diseases in the patient as well as in their uh, children. It offers us the ability to choose treatments based on what is precisely wrong with that person and not simply treat it the same disease in all people the same way. And with the biology of functions it allows us to objectively follow over time how well the patient responded to the treatment and it allows us to see which part of the treatment needs to be revised and which part of the treatment can be kept over time. In this way, ultimately, uh, a practice in endobiogenic medicine allows the physician to feel more satisfied and more in control of disease uh, management and it allows each patient to feel more satisfied because they've been heard and they receive more precise treatments and they get better faster.